بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآل الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم أكرمني بنور الفه اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن عيونك برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين this is our 10th session, which is a review of what we have discussed in the previous sessions. As you know, we have been studying the book Lessons on Islamic Morals. And we studied lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. Lesson four and five were about history of the science of akhlaq and recent development. So we left it for you to study. Well, was not difficult. And then lesson six, Islamic theory of ethics. Lesson seven, outcomes of living a moral life. And then after this section, we said we have four types of relations to be studied in akhlaq. Relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, relation with ourselves, relation with other people, relation with the rest of the creation like environment, animals, plants. Alhamdulillah, we managed to also finish the second part of the book, which is about relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We talked about remembrance of God, worshipping God, trusting God, repentance, and inshallah, if we have tawfiq to have another course, then we would go to the next section, which is about relation <coughs> with ourselves. So now I want to, inshallah, quickly review nine lessons uh, of the book. One, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There is a discussion in lesson one about the science of akhlaq. But before we understand the science of akhlaq, we have to understand what does akhlaq mean. In Arabic, we have two terms which are very similar. We said we have khalq and khulq. Khalq is something that you can see in people. It's the physical part of that creation. This is the khalq. Khulq is something that you cannot see. It needs insight. al khalq yudraku bil basar al khulq yudraku bil basira Sometimes you may be living with someone for some time, and still you don't know his akhlaq. When a time comes that that person has to react naturally, you can see. Yes, this is why we said, if you want to know someone, travel with him. Especially to a difficult trip, you know, like Hajj, and see, you know, when there are problems, <laughs> how patient he is, how fair he is, how sincere he is. Or do business with someone, and then you realize, you know, how honest this person is. And, of course, you know someone very well when you marry, but then the problem is that it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to be very careful before. So akhlaq is not something that you can easily understand. Unlike khalq. And we said, you know, we have this dua that when you stand before mirror, you say to Allah, oh Allah, in the same way that you have made my khalq good, make my khulq good. Okay? So... What is akhlaq? Akhlaq is the plural, plural form for khulq. Khulq has different plurals. It can be khulq, it can be akhlaq. Any moral traits of character that someone has come under akhlaq. Akhlaq of one person. Akhlaq of a group. 
اخلاق of a religion اخلاق of a community these are traits of character that these people have or traits of character that this religion this school of thought recommends so when we say what is muslim muslim or islamic ethics islamic morals it means what islam wants from muslims from human beings maybe what islam wants and what muslims do match maybe they don't match so if someone wants to write a book about akhlaq of muslims it can be different from what is akhlaq of islam but akhlaq of prophet and akhlaq of islam are the same because the prophet was example inshallah we should also be exam- good examples but unfortunately there are difficulties here so the science alamik the science of akhlaq is that science which studies our moral traits of character or our moral actions what do we mean by moral i mean voluntary actions because if something is not in my control this is not discussed in akhlaq for example we don't discuss in akhlaq the growth of your hair it has to be fast it has to be slow this is not akhlaq this but it's not in your control your beard become white it is not in your control yes sometimes indirectly we may discuss for example we say you shouldn't eat this food akhlaqi morally you should not eat this food because this can damage your health or that can make your life shorter so sometimes indirectly or for example breathing is not in your control but because you can stop and you know get suffocated so again from this aspect we can say in akhlaq this is wrong if you stop breathing anyway anything which is in your control as an action or as a quality is discussed in akhlaq but with this intention with this purpose to improve to get good qualities and get rid of bad qualities to do good actions and get rid of bad actions and we said in islam akhlaq is for both actions and traits of character because in some modern schools of ethics they only focus on actions on behavior they are not very much interested in virtues but there is a revival in virtue ethics and there are many people now that focus on virtues and we said relatively this is a good question sometimes in akhlaq i ask this question for example you can what is more important action or quality we say generally speaking quality is more important because action happens once but quality is something permanent of course you can stop it but normally it's endurable to do one generous act is important but to have quality of generosity is much more important of course i said sometime we are in circumstances that one action can be so crucial that that particular action can change your life so generally speaking quality is important but sometimes one action dharbatu aliyan yawm al khandaq afdal min ibadat al saqalay why because that was such a crucial time amir al mu'minin before that or after that didn't increase in bravery or in love for islam his qualities were the same but if he had not acted as he did islam could be defeated so one proper action in one proper time can boost you 
Yeah. On the other hand, sometimes critical situations come that if you fail to do properly, you can ruin your life. Like, for example, the people who didn't help Imam Hussein Ali Salam. Maybe they were good people. One mistake, one mistake is normally not big things, you know, you can make mistakes. But some mistakes can totally change your situation. You know, it's like, for example, a businessman, they make lots of transactions, but sometimes one decision can make them very rich or can make them bankrupt. Yeah? So you can be very successful over years, but one mistake is enough to finish. So in moral life is also the same. Sometimes one zulm finishes us. One word which was not supposed to be said or one silence which was not supposed to be kept can change. So we have to be very careful. So both actions and qualities are important in Islam. Relatively, qualities are more important, but there are exceptions. And then we said that in Islam, Akhlaq has very high position. Akhlaq is not something marginal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Innama bu'ithtu li utammim makarim al-akhlaq. He says the main task of him is to accomplish noble traits of character. We had a discussion about the difference between mahasin al-akhlaq and makarim al-akhlaq. Mahasin al-akhlaq means to do good to someone who has done good to you based on reciprocating good. Makarim is to do good to those who have done bad to you. Someone that you were in need, he didn't give you. You asked, he didn't give you. Now you know he is in need. You can do two things. Say, Alhamdulillah, now he's in need and I don't give him. Or you can have a makaram al You say, now even before he comes and asks me, I would give him. I don't want him to feel embarrassed because he knows that he has not given me. Now he feels embarrassed. So I don't want him to be embarrassed. I go and give him without asking. This is makaram al And Rasulullah has come for this. You were ill. They didn't come to visit you. Now you should be the first person to visit them. But when you visit them, don't say, you know, you didn't come and visit me. <laughs> Still, like, <laughs> no. Just very natural and very gentle, as a gentleman. So, we said, Rasulullah says this is the core of his mirror. Quran says, one of the tasks of the Prophet is yuzakihim. Taskiyah, purification. So, akhlaq is something so important that it's the main task of the Prophet. And also we had the discussion about, for example, the way Allah talks about the Prophets in the Quran. You find that moral characteristics of the Prophets are very highly stressed on the Quran. Then we had a discussion about what is the ultimate aim in Islamic ethics. What do you want to achieve? We said there are different ways of talking about the ultimate aim. You can say nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which needs explanation, of course. This is not physical nearness because Allah doesn't have a space to go closer to that space. It means to resemble Him more. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kind, merciful, generous, forgiving, grateful, we should try to have those qualities. 
the more you develop in your virtues, the closer you become to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In some more detailed discussions, uh, we had this, uh, but here we had it briefly, but in Akhlaq series in the Hose, that there are two sides for the same coin. Either you talk about nearness to God or you talk about <coughs> development in humanity. And Sana Kamen. When you become a real human being, it means you are a good servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adam Shodan. You remember we talked about Adam Shodan. Although we are all human beings, but we may not really be human beings. We may look like human beings. If you remember, I told you the teacher of Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Shah Abadi, used to change what was commonly said by people. People used to say, Adam Shodan, Mullah Shodan, Che Asan, Adam Shodan, Che Mushke. To become a scholar is easy, but to become Adam, to become a human being, is difficult. He used to say, Mullah Shodan Che Mushke, Adam Shodan Muhalas. To become a good scholar is very difficult, and to become a human being is impossible. <laughs> it's not easy to the extent that it's almost impossible. Of course, it's possible, but you should not underestimate. You have to be very careful. You have to be very sometimes harsh on yourself. Otherwise, you may think you are a good person, but you may be at the same time hurting many, many people. So we talked about the ultimate end in Islamic morality. Then we had also a discussion that even beliefs as Iman and Kufr relate to Akhlaq. Because Iman is not just to know something. Just to know is about mind. But Iman is to admit, to acknowledge by your heart. Therefore, Iman and Kof are moral issues. Maybe someone knows something, but doesn't accept practically, doesn't submit himself. Sometimes people know what is the truth. So in their mind, they know that this is true, but in their heart, they don't accept. They don't surrender. So we said even Quran looks at Kof as a moral issue. If someone is not really able to find the truth, he's excused, he's not blamed. But the problem is with the people who have all the means to know the truth and by Yenat manifest signs have come to them, but still they don't want to believe. Then we had a discussion about history of the science of Akhlaq and development that, as I said, we left it for you to study. Then we mentioned Islamic theory of ethics. We talked about importance of both actions and qualities, as I said. Importance of intention. We said intention is the foundation. An to asasul amal. Actually, without intention, your action has no moral significance. Yeah, if you do something physically, like a robot, it has no value. It is your intention that can make your action good or bad. And, of course, the intention has to be sincere. We had this hadith from Rasulullah, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَلَكُلِّ مُرَئِنْ مَا نَوَى Actions are based on the intention and judged based on the intention and every person would have what he has made intention for. The other thing was, we talked about self-love, hubbu zat. As you remember, I said, many scholars say that hubbu zat is the ultimate desire and motivation in us. Everything goes back to self-love. Even if someone sacrifices something, it's to gain something greater. So you give, for example, what you need, but in order to get reward, in order to 
get closer to God. So they say everything is out of self-love. But I had a different idea, if you remember. That I said, we believe that self-love is there, but I believe that at the same time, there is genuine independent desire in us for good of other people. We talked about serving God and serving others for the sake of God. We said in Islamic ethics, we are not just concerned about love for God and serving God. Love for God should lead to love for others for the sake of God. al fillah, Not just hubbullah. You should have love for God, but out of that love for everything else that is created by God. We talked about Islamic ethics embracing all aspects of human life. And here we talked about different faculties of human soul. You know, we said we have the faculty which is responsible for anger, al 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 responsible for anger, for rationality, for appetite. And we said in every faculty you should try to strike the balance. So the virtuous position is the balance. Going to extremes is a problem. If you are too brave, what happens? You want to fight all the time. <laughs> or if you are not sufficiently brave, then you let people humiliate you. There must be a balance. We call it shajar. In rationality, you have to be balanced. If you are too rational, you become too critical. You can never form any judgment. You can never make up your mind. You are always doubtful because you are too critical, too rational. If you are not enough in rationality, whatever people tell you, you accept. So there are two sides of the spectrum. Someone who accepts whatever he hears, someone who can never become certain. The balance is hikmah. That when there is good evidence, you can accept. You can become clear. Or for example, for shahwa, appetite. If someone is not interested in anything, has, for example, no desire for food, for anything worldly, it's not good. If someone has too much of desire and cannot control himself, this is also a problem. If uh, modesty and chastity is the balance. Then we talked about outcomes of living a moral life. How much time you have? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. So we said if someone lives a moral life, we would have complete support by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned some hadith Qudsi, hadith Mi'raj, very beautiful hadith. Knowledge. Allah would give him a special knowledge, which is not through learning. This is God-given knowledge that Allah gives. If you remember, we said Allah says, to the extent that لا أخفي عليه خاصة خلقي or علم خاصة خلقي I would not hide from him knowledge about the select of my creation. I would let him, to know, let him know everything. Exclusive devotion to God. Entrance to the realm of light. Immense love for God. Witnessing Allah in everything. And then internal peace. After that, we entered second section of the book. So these were introductory lessons. Then we started with the second section, which was about virtues related to our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have started with dhikr, remembrance of Allah. If you remember, we talked about significance of dhikr. We said dhikr is everything good that you can do. Allahumma inni ataqarrabu ilayka bi dhikrik. Ya man ismuhu dawa wa dhikruhu shifa. We said forgetfulness and heedless are the main problems. And nisyan wal ghafla. To forget or to be heedless. These are the main problems. And remembrance, alertness, awakeness, 
these are the best things for a person who wants to travel towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said everything has a limit except zikr. Zikr has no limits. Remember Allah as much as you can. Then we talked about tasbih. We had good discussion about tasbih, the significance of tasbih. Tasbih of the people of heaven, tasbih of the people uh, who are either mu'min or angels in heaven. Tasbih of mu'minin in dunya. Tasbih of birds and animals and all beings. Tasbih in salat. We discussed about all these things. And we said tasbih includes praising God, includes tahleel, includes istighfar. If you remember, we discussed this. After remembrance, we talked about worshipping and serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We said this is the aim of creation. Ma khalaqtul jinnah wal insallah liya'budun. But we said to worship is a lesser level compared to to serve. We don't want to be worshipper only. We want to be servant. There is a difference between abid and abd. Abid does ibadah. Abd has ubudiyah. Ibadah is a matter of action. Ubudiya is a matter of being. Abed is doing ibadah as long as he is busy with actions. But abd, 24 hours is abd. <coughs> Even when you are sleeping, you are abd. If someone has a servant, as a slave for example, whether he is doing something for him or not doing, is a slave, is a servant. A servant has full-time, permanent relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A servant thinks of himself as servant. When you ask a servant, who are you? He doesn't say his name. He says, the name of his master. I am Abd of so-and-so. He doesn't say, what is his name? So we talked about servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we said that through servitude to Allah you can reach everything servitude to Allah is a substance whose essence is lordship then we talked about tawakkul trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we said you do your best and leave to Allah the rest not that you leave to Allah what you are supposed to do. <laughs> you are supposed to do everything that you can, but there are many things that are out of your control. You have no power, no access, no control. For those things, you need to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even for you to be able to perform, you need to, of course, trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you do your best. And we said, tawakkul is one of those spiritual tools that has no limit in its power. The only thing that limits it is your spirit. You know, we said we have physical tools and spiritual tools. Physical tools, they have limits attached to them. For example, you have a sword, you have a knife, you have a gun. What is the ability of this weapon? It's limited. But a spiritual tools, their limit is coming only from the spirit of the person who is using them. How much you can gain from dua? Dua has no limit. Your spirit makes a difference. How much you can gain from tawakkul? No limits. It is you and your spirit that which, uh, brings limitation. Otherwise, tawakkul can do wonders if we know how to do tawakkul. Okay? We mentioned the story of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib. When Abraham attacked Mecca, he put his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah protected Mecca. 
But there were many other times that Allah didn't protect Mecca. Kaaba was destroyed. Why? Because there was no someone like Abdul Muttalib in charge of Kaaba who puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even when it comes to Kaaba, Allah doesn't just look at Kaaba's value, looks at the people who are protecting it. Are they mutawakkil or no? They think they can do it themselves. If you say, oh Allah, I look after your religion myself. I look after your community, my family, everything myself. Allah says, okay, let's see what you do. <laughs> and you will fail. But if you put your tawakkul in Allah, you do your best, but you say, he is in charge. I am not in charge. I am just a servant. I am just a cleaner, a caretaker. Then he would take over. And after tawakkul, we talked about tawbah. We said that tawbah means return for everything that we do, which is wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, prepares us for return. Taballahu alayhim liyatubu. He invites us for Tawbah. He softens our heart for Tawbah. He encourages us for Tawbah. So, first He comes to us so that we go back to Him. Then He welcomes us. So, every Tawbah of us is surrounded by two Tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah alayhim liyatubu. And then after we do Tawbah, inna Allah tawabun rahim. So, He accepts our Tawbah. Like when your child runs away from home, you send someone to bring him back. When the child comes and says, you know, sorry, then you hug him and kiss him and say, you don't need to worry. Everything is all right. Even you may, you know, try to make him happy. You say, you know, let's now to the, tonight go out and, you know, have a food outside. Or let's, you know... Uh, for example, give you a gift. So Allah has a special love and mercy for the sinners who go back to Him. Yeah? Even Hadith Qudsi says, لَوْ عَلِمَ الْمُدْبِرُونَ عَنِّي كَيْفَ اشْتِيَاقِي بِهِمْ لَمَا شَوْقًا If those who have turned their back to me, they know how much I yearn for them, they would have died. This is how much Allah is waiting for them. You know, imagine you have a very good son at home. He's studying and praying. And you have a bad son who has run away. Which one you have more concern for? The bad one you have more concern for. You do your best that he comes back. This one, you love him. But your concern is for the other one. So, we talked about Toba and what... Tawbah means is to regret first and to decide not to repeat. If you really regret, you decide not to repeat and to compensate, whatever is possible. If there is qadha, a prayer, fasting, if someone's money you have, you know, for example, misappropriated, you have to give back. If there is any way to restore, to compensate, you should do it. And the main thing is, the last point, we said that if someone commits a sin, if he doesn't improve, when he's put in the same condition, he repeats the same sin. Like a person who is very hungry, and because he's very hungry, then there is a very fresh, nice smelling bread he eats. When his stomach is full, he says, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. Salaam alaykum. But this is not enough. Why? Because now his hunger is over. He says, Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. The main thing is that he should regret so much and should understand the ugliness of this so much that even if he is put in the same condition, 
he would say, Astaghfirullah, I don't want to touch this bread. Not that every time, when he's hungry, he eats, and then after, he says, Astaghfirullah. When he's, you know, in the situation of Ghaiba, and he's very excited, he does Ghaiba, when he goes home and he's alone, he says, Astaghfirullah. And again, does the same thing. This is not a good Tawbah. A good Tawbah is that even if you are put again in the same condition, you would not do it. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this blessing of having these 10 sessions. Alhamdulillah. I hope, inshallah, whatever we learned, we would be able, inshallah, to practice. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Oh,